please join me in welcoming our esteemed speaker, John Philip Neal. Thank you, Joel. Good evening to you. One of the most cherished images in the Celtic world from which I draw so heavily in my life and in my teachings is the image or the memory of John the Beloved leaning against Jesus at the Last Supper. And it was said of him in Celtic legend that he had therefore heard the heartbeat of God. And he became a symbol of the practice of listening. Listening deep within ourselves, listening deep within one another, listening within the body of the earth for the beat of the sacred presence. I invite us into that posture tonight, into that deep listening. And I invite us to listen within, perhaps for what we've never heard before, or perhaps for what we've forgotten the deepest sound of our being, of God. One of the things the Celtic tradition does is remember that the first thing that is said about us in our Hebrew scriptures is that we are made in the image and likeness of God. That's like a foundational statement. Everything else that is said about us needs, I believe, to be said in the light of that foundational truth. That we are made in the image and likeness of the one from whom everything has come. Or as Julian of Norwich in the 14th century puts it so simply, but so radically, when she says we're not just made by God, we are made of God. That is, we're not simply fashioned from afar by a distant creator, but she sees us as coming out of the very essence or out of the very womb of the one. Which is one of the reasons why Julian so loves to refer to God as mother as well as father, because she sees us as coming out of the very substance or out of the womb of God. Now, what does it mean to say that we are made of God? In part, it is to say that the wisdom of God is deep within us, deeper than the ignorance of what we have done. It is to say that the creativity of God, something of the essence of the creativity that is at the heart of the expanding universe, forever finding new form, new expression, something of the essence of that creativity is deep within us, deeper than any barrenness in our lives or relationships, deeper than any apparent dead ending in our nation or in our world. This capacity, <clears throat> pure gift of God, this capacity to bring into being what has never been before. But to say that we are made of God is to say above all else for Julian, it is to say that we, the deep within us is the love of God or that what she calls the yearning love longings of God. The yearnings for oneness, the holy desire for union. And these are deeper in us than any of the fears or hatreds that lead to the tragedy of fragmentation and separation that we know witness in our world and that we know in our own nations. So part of what I'm inviting us to do tonight <clears throat> is to ask what would it look like for our of Godness to come forth again in radically new ways. Or to use one of Jesus's favorite mantras, what would it look like 
if we were to be born again. Now this mantra is so central to Jesus' wisdom that we need to reclaim this phrase. It's been hijacked by one end of the religious spectrum and it's been hijacked to give the impression that we need to become something other than ourselves. But let's be clear, Jesus was a rabbi. So his starting point was not the fourth century imperial church's doctrine of original sin. That's a Christian problem. It's not a Jewish problem, <laughs> nor is it a Muslim problem. These great traditions remember that what is deepest in us is sacred. And the doctrine of original sin, as propagated by the religion of empire when Christianity got into bed with power, was a convenient truth to empire, I believe. We need to ask many questions about what was happening in the fourth century when our religious household moved from being a persecuted minority to wielding power and prestige and privilege. So Jesus' starting point was not the doctrine of original sin. This doctrine that has been used to give the impression that what is deepest in us is opposed to God rather than what is deepest in us being of God. I was part of an interfaith dialogue a number of years ago in Richmond, Virginia. There was a rabbi, an imam, and I was there as the Christian teacher. I mean, it sounds like the beginning of a joke, doesn't it? <laughs> <clears throat> and um, at one point, uh, someone in the audience asked if we, if we would speak about uh, uh, the doctrine of original sin. <clears throat> and uh, the rabbi was the first to respond. And he said, original sin. He said, that to most Jews would mean, that was a really original sin. That, <coughs> that was a really creative sin. <coughs> At that point I thought, thank God for interfaith dialogue. Um, uh, here this rabbi had got a whole room full of primarily Christians laughing about this absurd doctrine. And I am very intentional about that word. It's an absurd doctrine. And it could also be described as perverted. One only has to hold a newborn child in one's arms to know how absurd this teaching is. I regard the births of my four children as the most sacred moments of my life. In their face I could see, glimpse, something of the countenance from which all life has come. In their skin I could smell something of the freshness of life's origins. I believe we know this at a deep level. The doctrine of original sin I often describe as our obsessive compulsive disorder in the Christian household. We can hardly get through a liturgy without going on about what shit bags we are. <laughs> I mean, if, if every time I entered the presence of my wife, I felt I had to go on about how horrible I was. Uh, I, I mean, she might like it once. <laughs> but if I did that every time I entered her presence, it would be a very sick, very sick relationship. <clears throat> so we know the sacredness of the newborn. We know it in a deep way. Even if our religious tradition has not told us this, we know it. Many years ago, I was giving a talk in Lynchburg, Virginia. <clears throat> and at the end of my talk, in which I was exploring some of these themes, a woman, I think in her 80s, 
came very purposefully up the central aisle with a copy of Listening for the Heartbeat of God in her hand, this book in which I explore the Celtic tradition. <clears throat> she was coming up the aisle so purposefully that the naughty boy in me thought, she's going to hit me over the head with that book. <clears throat> and uh, I was quite wrong. When she got up to the front, she said, I want to show, show you what I wrote in this book. <clears throat> After reading it, <clears throat> she opened the cover, and inside she had written, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. <laughs> I so often wish I had asked her for that copy, because she had said so beautifully, so simply, so succinctly, what our deep response is when we hear ancient wisdom that we've lost sight of. That when we hear it, there's a, oh, I, I knew it. I knew this. I may not have been taught it. This may not have been explicitly spoken. But I know this. I know this to be true. Since that encounter with the Lynchburg woman and many similar encounters over the years, I've increasingly come to believe that this is exactly how we should see what it is we're trying to do when we try to articulate wisdom and truth. That we're simply trying to give expression to what the soul already knows. We're not trying to deposit a foreign truth in the heart of the listener. And of course it's very dangerous practice and religion, the religion of Western Christianity has often pursued this very dangerous route of thinking that it has truth. And let us generously tell you what it is. Our role as teachers, as a teaching community, I believe is to utter, to find articulation for what the soul of the listener already knows. Our work is liberation work. It's about giving expression to what's already there in ways that can help translate that deep wisdom into action, into compassion. In the Celtic world, it is often said that we have forgotten who we are or that we suffer from soul forgetfulness. So Christ is celebrated and spoken of as our memory. We have forgotten who we are. Christ is our memory. Or he's sometimes spoken of as our revelation this word that comes from the Latin root revelare, which just means to lift the veil. So Christ is celebrated as lifting the veil, not to show us a foreign truth, but to show us the deepest truth of our being, that we are made of God, that what is deepest in us is of the sacredness of the Holy One. Many years ago, I was leading a retreat on the holy island of Lindisfarne in Northumbria. <clears throat> it's a beautiful tidal island, Lindisfarne, so when the tide is in, Lindisfarne is an island. When the tide is out, it's possible to walk over or um, to drive um, onto Lindisfarne. It has that lovely tidal rhythm but on the first night of the retreat, I, uh, in which I was exploring Celtic themes, I had a recurring dream that kept coming at me all night. And in the dream, my second daughter, um, a beautiful young woman, objective father, uh, but a beautiful young dancer, uh, she was um, in the dream, she was being told that she was ugly, 
that she was stupid, that she knew nothing. And to begin with in the dream, she would look, look perplexed. Why was this being said? The more it was said, she began to look hurt. And the more it was said, she became inarticulate. The definition was finding its way into her. And at some level she was believing it, and in a sense becoming paralyzed by it. This is exactly what we've been doing in the Christian household to the extent that we've given central place to the doctrine of original sin, in which it has been taught that what is deepest in us is ugly, or what is deepest in us is ignorant, or what is deepest in us is without creativity, and the list goes on and on. This is exactly what we've been doing in the Church of England tradition for centuries. We have at Evensong been praying, there is no health in us. In our Church of Scotland inheritance, our confession of faith, our statement of faith, says we are made opposite to all that is good, wholly defiled in body and in soul. Shall we laugh? Shall we weep? I think we need to do both. We need to laugh at the absurdity of this teaching and we need to weep at the terrible wrong it has done and it is doing in the hearts and minds, in the bodies of our sisters and brothers. And many of us in this room know those haunted places that we go because this is what we have been given the impression of or explicitly taught. Towards morning on that long night on Linda's farm when the dream just kept coming at me, towards morning I moved into a half consciousness and found myself speaking my daughter's name out loud to myself. Kirsten, Margaret, Iona. Kirsten, Margaret, Iona. And the more conscious I became, the more I realized I was saying her name because that is who she is. She is Kirsten which means Christ one. Or as Jared Manley Hopkins, the poet says, we are what Christ is, immortal diamond. He lifts the veil to show us the diamond essence of our being. She is Margaret, which means pearl. She is beyond price, a jewel. And she is Iona that island in the sea to which people come from all over the world for healing, for renewal. She carries within herself the sacred wellspring of the Holy One as part of the healing of the world. One particular name, but of a universal family. Now I pay enough attention to my dreams to realize that this is not primarily a dream about my daughter. This is a dream, I believe, in, uh, about a part of myself, maybe a feminine part of myself, that doubts my beauty, that doubts my sacred feminine wisdom and intuition. We must, I believe, exorcise our household of this absurd doctrine. It has done enormous damage and I believe it inhibits our relationship not only with the deepest parts of ourself but it often inhibits or taints or distorts how we view the so-called other. We assume that what is deepest is opposed to the sacred 
rather than of the sacred. I often think about the edifice of Western theological inheritance from the fourth century onwards, this great construct of theology. And if one takes out the doctrine of original sin piece, the whole edifice collapses. Because nearly every major, every other major doctrine is built on that starting point, including the sickness of a doctrine like substitutionary atonement in which we have allowed our household to continue to give the impression that God somehow requires payment to forgive. Who are the people who have loved us in our lives? Truly loved us. Could we imagine them needing to be paid to forgive us? So, so much of the construct is based on that 4th century doctrine. I'd like to spend a bit of time tonight <clears throat> on the first historically recorded teacher in the British Celtic world, a monk by the name of Pelagius, P-E-L-A-G-I-U-S. You might have heard of him. And if you have, uh, it will likely have been in an entirely negative light. He is the most misrepresented and the most misunderstood Christian teacher of all time. And tragically, that misrepresentation continues in most of our Western seminaries. In Edinburgh, for instance, where I studied, generation after generation of theological student was required to write an essay comparing Pelagius with St. Augustine of Hippo. And it was known full well in advance who the hero was to be and who the villain was to be. And we were given three misrepresentations of Pelagius. We were told there were no writings from his hand. So all we could learn about him came through the mouth of his theological opponent, Augustine, which of course led to a very fair analysis. <laughs> well, we now, now know that there are plenty of writings from his hand, and guess what? He was not saying what Augustine said he was saying. History has been written by the conqueror, the imperial religious tradition. Second misrepresentation, we were not told where he was from. He could have come from anywhere in the cosmos the way he was taught. <coughs> well, we now know that he was one of us. He was a Celt. He was from Wales. And what he was teaching was not some idiosyncratic heresy. What he was teaching was the norm in the Celtic world. Third misrepresentation, we were told that he taught that we didn't need grace, <clears throat> that we had the capacity to somehow save ourselves. Well, in looking at his writings, it's very clear that he knows that we need grace but he speaks about the sacredness of our nature. So he sees grace not as opposed to our nature, <clears throat> but rather grace is given to reconnect us to the heart of our nature, our essence of God. That grace is given not that we might become something other than natural or more than natural, Grace is given that we may be truly natural, that we may live from our true nature of God. And he offers a wonderfully succinct statement when he says, nature is the gift of being, and that is a sacred gift. 
Nature is the gift of being, and grace is the gift of well-being. Grace is given that we may reconnect with the holy essence of our being. So Pelagius arrived in Rome around 400. <clears throat> Almost immediately, he was criticized on three fronts. First of all, he was criticized for spending too much time with women, teaching them how to read and to interpret the scriptures. Already the place of women had been so subordinated in imperial Christianity that it was considered unacceptable for women to be reading or interpreting the scripture. Pelagius was simply doing in Rome what the norm was in the Celtic world, and that was an honoring of the sacred feminine and a celebrating female lead leadership. The second criticism directed at Pelagius was concerning his hairstyle, <laughs> which doesn't sound a very profound uh, criticism, but behind it, there is a fear. Because what he wore was not the Roman tonsure, which was shaved up on the crown of the head with a ring of hair, uh, symbolic of the crown of thorns that were placed on Jesus' head during, crucifix or during trial and crucifixion. <clears throat> Pelagius wore what was known as the Celtic tonsure, but the Celtic ton which was long-haired, but the Celtic tonsure had been the Druidic tonsure. So Pelagius arrived very clearly reverencing the pre-Christian wisdom. And Christ was seen not as opposed to the pre-Christian wisdom, the Druidic wisdom that knew the harmony of the spheres, that knew the healing elements of the plants and the earth that celebrated the wisdom of the human soul. Christ was seen not as opposed to the pre-Christian wisdom, but rather as bringing it into greater expression. It's an exact parallel to what happened in Palestine when Jesus was celebrated not as opposed to Hebrew wisdom, but as, in a sense, a New Testament, not opposed to the, what we uh, call the Old Testament, but rather bringing it further forward. The third criticism directed at Pelagius, and this is the one that we hear most of, is he taught that when we look into the face of a newborn child, we are looking into the face of God, freshly born among us. Some of you know that three years ago, <clears throat> I was elevated to a new status in the universe. I became a grandfather for the first time. <laughs> and my daughter Rowan gave birth to her uh, first, firstborn uh, and named her Ember, E-M-B-E-R. Uh, Ember arrived like a shining in the middle of a darkness, dark winter, Scottish winter. I got to hold Ember in my arms just a few hours after she was born. And as I drove into the hospital that night, I realized I was going in with my Pelagius text. When we look into the face of a newborn child, we are looking into the face of God, freshly born among us. And that's certainly part of the grace of what happened for me that night. But I'd like to share with you what I was not expecting. Uh, when I held her in my arms, she was so peaceful. And she was just gazing up towards my face. And in that moment, I experienced God looking into my face. And I wept as we do. 
when we are most deeply seen in love. I was sharing this uh, with a pediatrician in Colorado a couple of months ago. And he said, when exactly did you hold Amber? I mean, tell me, how, how long was it after? So I said, well, it was probably about two hours. He said, ah, if the birth has been straightforward, no sort of medicine uh, complications, <clears throat> he said, um, the child is, has that peace. So he said, that was God looking into your face. <laughs> Uh, I knew that already, but it was it was good. It was, um. So we know this. This is a deep knowing. My son-in-law Graham is a deeply spiritual man. Um, he is emphatically not. Uh, he does not define himself in religious terms. Like so many of his generation, he has been deeply disenchanted by his religious inheritance. So he rarely uses the word God. But I spoke to him the day after Ember's birth, and I was asking him how he was doing. And he said, uh, uh, he said, you know, last night when I left hos the hospital and Ron and Ember stayed in hospital, and he said after that long, long labor, um, when he eventually went home. He said, the drive home should have taken me 20 minutes, he said. But uh, he said it took me 45 minutes to get home. Because as I was driving, every time I thought of Ember's face, I began to weep. And I'd have to pull off the road and sit and weep at the side of the road. And then he would think, I, I can do this, I can drive home. <laughs> and he'd get back on the road and think about Ember's face again, he'd begin to weep. And he said, he said, in Ember's face, I saw the face of God. Now, where did he get that? He hadn't read Pelagius. Well, he hadn't then, I've given him Pelagius now. <laughs> But he, he got that because we know that. Three weeks later, um, our second grandchild was born. Um, Kristen gave birth to a little boy and called him Santino, which means little saint. Uh, and thank God he is not that yet. Um, in fact, if I could just give you a little glimpse into how he is not a saint yet. Um, I was out not too long ago uh, walking with Santino. And he knew I had a biscuit, uh, a cookie, in my pocket. And he said to me, he calls me Baba, he said, Baba, I want a biscuit. And I said, uh, Santino, we say please in this family. He did not look happy with me at all. It was like, if you think I'm going to say please, <laughs> you've got another thing coming. So um, the biscuit was already out of the package, and I put it back in, and I said, well, maybe later you'll want to say please. Oh, he was not happy. He was scowling at me. But he was not going to say please. Good, good strong ego in that wee man. <laughs> And uh, so about half an hour later in the walk, we were in the botanical gardens by the stage, and I had long since forgotten about the biscuit episode. And, uh, but he had not forgotten. He, wa <laughs> he wanted to raise the subject again. But he's such a beautiful little man, and when he, uh, at intense moments like this, he doesn't want to look you in the face. This was too intense a matter, so he, he didn't want to look me in the eyes, but sort of looking down to the side, he said, Baba, it won't come out. <laughs> the please 
will not come out. I mean, is that not fantastic? You know, often in life we know we should be doing something, it will not come out. So I said, well, it'll come out if you want. It did not come out. He never got the biscuit. So, you know, he will either become a saint if he, if he gets a hold of his ego, or he'll do a terrible menace to, you know, he'll be a terrible menace. But uh, this wonderful, I remember meeting Bede Griffiths, that great Benedictine monk who spent most of his life in India. And I spent a, a really life-changing three weeks in his company. And I was a young father at that stage. And Bede was so interested. He, s he kept asking about the children. And, um, and he, said, he said, make sure they have strong egos. Make sure they have a very strong sense of self so that when the time comes, they will know how to die to themselves in order to truly live. To div live from the soul at the heart of their being. Not to, that's not to disparage the ego. This amazing faculty of consciousness and willpower that we've been given. But it's to say that the ego is given to serve the center, not to be the center. To serve the holy center at the heart of one another and at the heart of all. And that's just to speak of the individual ego, but think of the ego of this nation. Think of the ego of the British Empire. Think of the enormous ego of our Christian household at times. Think of the enormous ego of the human species that we think it's just about serving ourselves and not the holiness at the heart of every creature and every life form. So we as a family, within three weeks, were graced with a little feminine face of the divine, a little masculine face of the divine. We need both within us, among us, between us. Our Western world and culture and so much of our Western religion has been dominated by a shadow form of masculine power, which has arrayed itself over against the earth and often over against the feminine. And so many of us are longing for a deep integration of the sacred masculine and the sacred feminine within ourselves and within our communities, within our nation, within our religious households. We need desperately to recover the sacred feminine within us, both as individuals, as men, and as women, as communities. Only then will we truly know again what the sacred masculine is, because these energies are given to dance together. They're given to make love within us and among us. And only then will we be well. A couple of years ago in my research, I came across what appears to be an ancient Iona prophecy. It would be interesting for me to see, show of hands, how many of you have been to the island of Iona. Yeah, great. Well, the rest of you need to come. <laughs> um, not all at once. <laughs> it's a small island. But we have these uh, weekly, week-long pilgrimages on Iona. People come from all over the world. And um, I'd love to welcome you there. 
often a time of real change, real deep challenge and blessing. But uh, I discovered this, what appears to be this ancient Iona prophecy. I haven't been able to date its historical strand yet, but it appears to be an early one. And uh, the Iona prophecy says that just as the masculine face of God was shown to us in Jesus, the feminine face of God will be made known to us through Iona. And on that day, says the prophecy, the world will know peace. Now, I don't believe this prophecy is to be interpreted literally or limitedly to Iona, but I understand this prophecy. I understand why it came into being. I understand why it was expressed in the Celtic world. Because this is a stream of wisdom in which the sacred feminine and the sacred masculine have been robustly and deeply celebrated as both essential to our well-being, that they're given to conjoin within us and among us. This, I believe, is the day we are longing for. So the Celtic tradition is inviting us to look for the sacred in all, in every child, in every man and woman, in every creature and life form, to see this sacredness, to adore it, to serve it, to be part of liberating it in one another. Many years ago, I was giving a talk in Ottawa, in Canada, and a Mohawk elder had been invited to make observation about any parallels between Celtic wisdom and his First Nations spiritual wisdom of the Mohawk people. At the end of the evening, he stood this um, strong, and humble man, with tears in his eyes. And he said, as I've been listening, I've been wondering where I would be tonight. I've been wondering where my people would be tonight. I've been wondering where we would be as a Western world tonight if the mission that had come to us from, from Europe centuries ago had come expecting to find light in us. Mm -hmm. wow. The true light that enlightens every person coming into the world, says John. We can't undo this tragic part of our Western Christian inheritance Perhaps humanity has never seen, never witnessed such an arrogant form of religion, conquering, triumphing, in the name of the so-called humble one. We can't undo it. We can, however, be part of a new birthing, a new beginning. Allowing our devotion to the light that is in Christ to lead us to be devoted to the light, that same light, that is deep within every human being and every life form. Will we continue to tolerate the impression being given that the light that we love in Christ is somehow essentially foreign or is somehow essentially an exception rather than disclosing or revealing and calling us to adore, to reverence, and to serve that light, that light of life that is at the heart of everything that has being. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah.